Uh, do you hear me? Yes, very much. Um, oh, now I hear that, yes. Really? So you hear now? Now I do. Oh, great. So, so, so finally. Yes. I'm happy to see you. And uh, I, uh, we are preparing for the conference 2019, EAGT guest conference. <laughs> and you will be one of the five or six keynote speakers. Mm -hmm. Is a chance for us to have a free conversation, some uh, switching some ideas or thoughts about the conference, and I prepared mm -hmm. some questions. But I also very much interested in, in your personal uh, thoughts, what you would like to share with us, uh, connecting to even Israel or any other projects you are in nowadays, because we are really interested in you. First of all, as an individual. Uh, my first question is What inspired you to accept, uh, accept our invitation to the conference as a keynote speaker? Well, um, I think it's the same thing that inspires my work in general these days, and the same thing that keeps me working so much at my age. <laughs> I don't know your age, but you look really wonderful, energetic, and so very good. So, <laughs> age doesn't well, matter, probably. What's that? I think age doesn't matter at, at your occasion. No, but, um, it, uh, well, age matters. Uh, the <laughs> that's the young person speaking. <laughs> I'll be 75 by the time I come there, so, uh, uh, I, which is great, and I'm very blessed and all like that, and um, I don't think age matters in some ways, but I did not expect to be working so much, particularly at Esalen, still at this age, and it's related to your question, because all of that to me is uh, you know, we, it's nothing new to say our world that, that we know is in crisis. It's in multiple crises. The most uh, urgent and threatening crises uh, really ever in the history of the world. I think, you know, the, the nuclear threat of my youth uh, was perhaps equaling it in a way, uh, and that threat is still there. But... Uh, you know, when we, when we look at what's happening in the world and the inability of human beings as we are organized today in our minds and in our social systems, and those cannot be separated, um, the inability to deal with the overwhelming complex complexity of the world now. That's the biggest change when I look back at my life over the last 50 or 60 years. Um, the amount of complexity that a given person is expected to deal with anywhere in the world, and there is no aspect of world complexity anymore that doesn't affect everybody. And we see the... Uh, the 20th century behind us um, was a century ripped apart by the reactions to modernity. Um, I think we, we can understand fascism uh, in overall uh, because the ideologies differ. And, um, but essentially, it's a, a reaction to modernity, to modernism which people uh, were not prepared to handle. And um, so they felt they fell back, they retreated into tribalisms, and they invented new tribalisms and new ways to separate from each other. Nazism, all the different fascisms we had, East and West, of course, Stalinism, all these, and tore the world apart over this, much of the world. Now we're in the same, you know, we haven't resolved those things, and we're back in, we're facing them even more urgently today. It comes out, you know, the symptom is all this reaction to uh, immigration, 
and a fear of loss of something which is spurring fascisms in, in your country and in mine. Uh, white supremacy, we thought that was over in America. You know, America is founded in this racial conflict of slavery and Native Americans. And when I was young, after World War II, we felt we are finally really making progress on those issues. And no one in America, outside of an insane asylum, when I was young and when I was 25, would have said, I'm a white supremacist. They wouldn't, they, if they thought it, they wouldn't have thought they could say it. But now they do. A white nationalism, the alt-right, and you have versions of it all over Europe. And uh, so that's the crisis that keeps me working uh, in areas that um, I didn't expect to be working this hard in, this much in, at this age. I didn't expect to be starting at 7 in the morning <laughs> with meetings. Yeah, all right. Wonderful. So, Gordon, I, I'm just thinking about what you are speaking about, this complexity, and the, your uh, next year presence at the conference. And uh, I'm just thinking that uh, is there anything in this complexity which is very much connected to fertile void, which is the main theme of the conference. To the void? Yes. Um, the fertile void is such an attractive and fascinating topic. <laughs> and uh, I think it's one that often has not been approached in the right way in, in the Gestalt tradition. Um, because the fertile void is not the place we are evolved to live in. Human beings have evolved to cope with situations, to cope creatively. The human being is the animal that does not, is not driven by instincts. Other animals are programmed for a certain environment. When that environment changes, they have to change very rapidly or that species dies out most, most commonly. And a new species can arise and so forth. Humans have persisted and dominated the globe by having become freed from instinct patterns. So that we, are, we have this flexible brain. This is what Gestalt is all about. We, can, we uh, approach a situation, we can combine it in a new creative way. And that's, that's what the early Gestalt research a century ago dealt with, was they were really trying to get at, wait a minute, we've got these Freudians that was becoming very big then, that say that we're really just driven by biological instincts and, every, you know, and our consciousness is really a, a side effect, but not driving the show. And if you want to know what somebody thinks or feels or what they understand, they're the last person you should ask. You should ask their analyst because the analyst understands them and the person is just in denial. <laughs> uh, so that was that perspective. And then on the other hand, you had the mechanists, the behaviorists, the early behaviorists. They're more sophisticated now, of course saying, well, no, it's all training, it's all environment, it's all reinforcement, and you, uh, and so a human is much more like a machine. And along came the Gestaltists and said, you're leaving something out. There's a synthetic step that the human mind goes through, an interpretive step. You know, the greatest of all the research Gestaltists, Kurt Lewin, or Levine, said, um, there is no such thing as an absolute perception. There is no perception without interpretation. And that gives you that cultural relativism, that um, interpretive relativism in, in meeting reality and dealing with it, which was so alarming to um, lots of people with early Gestalt. And again, in the 60s and the 70s, like, 
no, no, it's not fundamentalist enough. Where's your basic text? And not only people outside of Gestalt, but within Gestalt. We had many people when I was young who wanted to reduce Gestalt to a fundamentalist text. It was a certain way of doing things. You had to do them the way Pearls did them, or you weren't getting authentic emotion. Uh, Goodman was always a little different. But the truth is, um, the picture that's painted by the early Gestaltists, the picture that Goodman built the theory on, and Pearls applied it in one way, but Goodman's theory left a lot of space for interpretation. We approach a situation, we interpret it creatively, freely, with a mixture of old expectation and new experience, and we synthesize something new. And that's what we're doing all the time in life, all the time. We think we're having, uh, we think we're separating observation from interpretation. But of course, we never really completely do. Our observations always have an element of subjectivity in them. That's our source of our strength as humans. We can always think a new thought. We can create something that didn't exist before. But the complexity of that becomes overwhelming. When you look at a different complex social species like ants or social insects, they have almost no brain. And with a couple of little chemical on off switches, kind of a little uh, binary system in there, they can do enormously complex things as a whole hive. So they can follow tray, they can follow to where the food is, and then they can let that trace evaporate, and they can be enormously efficient, but they cannot change. That's why there's over 10,000 species of ants in the world, each one adapted to a particular environment. If that environment changes, they migrate or they die. Doesn't matter, there's more species. How many human species are there in the world? One, because we can adapt to different environments. So, but the problem of that is complexity, back to that, because we're in the age of complexity now. Um, complexity can become overwhelming. It is, we can, and tolerating complexity requires support. Support is a topic that was long neglected in Gestalt. It's to me, it's the most important topic we must deal with theoretically in, in our practical work as Gestaltists today. And we can, we can deal with it, but we need to turn the lens of our attention um, on the question of support. We've paid so much attention to figure in Gestalt theory. We have to go back to ground and pay attention to ground. Now that brings us to the fertile void. Where do we get away from this busy coping, busy coping that we do all day long? Trying to, because humans do things in an organized, fresh, creative way, which means we're constantly problem solving. Another classic um, statement of Lewin's that every perception has the quality of solving a problem. All perception is not one-to-one -one objective registration. It's a kind of problem solving. I look at a scene to make meaning out of it so that I can cope with what's next. If I want to get refreshed, get a break from that, I have to actually learn techniques for doing that. My natural thing is cope, cope, cope. Synthesize, 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 solve, solve, solve. That's our survival characteristic. That's what we're involved for. If I want to take a breath, I have, then I can meditate. And the fertile void 
Well, one thing about the total void is it's a potentially meditative spot. We, we step back, we loosen this problem-solving grab that we put on reality, trying to do something with it. Uh, and uh, and we, have a, we can have a wonderful feeling of relaxation and come back with new creativity because we've loosened our, our hold. And this is what happens in the world today. Our hold on reality, which is our versions of reality, our interpretations, is too tight. That's it. It's too, too tight. We hold on too tight to our own interpretations, too, too firmly. Our grasp is too firm. We don't, we have trouble loosening it. The more the conditions are dangerous in the ground, the more the, the less support there is for me, the tighter I hang on to my habits. The, to the structure of the brain deals with complexity by constantly inventing or, or uh, strengthening habits. I can't, you know, I you watch, this is classic, but you watch a baby walk and they're trying to solve the problem of walking. And it takes all their concentration. And then they see some, the teddy bear, and they want to get over to that teddy bear, and they forget about walking and they fall down. That's because all of their attention had to be on walking. They were trying to organize it. Pretty soon, that's habituated. It's automated. It's organized. And they do that uh, automatically while going to get the teddy bear. So the intention of going to get something activates all these habits, which are established by now in the brain. And, uh, and then you start to be able to do more and more complex things. Now, this is what therapy is about. As we learn these patterns in life, relational patterns, how I, because everything we do is relational, how I deal with people, how do I deal with men? How do I deal with women? How do I deal with sexual situations? How do I do, deal with power? How do I deal with intellectual challenge? How do I deal with friendship? I have many, many organized habits to fall back on so that I can, but they're not, they may be very flexible. If they were formed under conditions of support developmentally, they are not, they remain flexible and continue to evolve as I get older. If they were formed under dire emergency conditions, they're not flexible. They're, so that I always react to a threatening man this way. I always, if you raise your hand, I have a trauma reaction. I can't, I have no choice. Um, the frontal cortex is, you know, is not involved very well that's those are the extremes you wanted to ask something i'm going on and on go ahead and make a comment well, yeah after you are speaking about it's so interesting and i have several thoughts and comments in me but i don't want to interrupt you <laughs> well i would just say that when we come back out of the fertile void we come into a world which we have, or back into a world which we have organized by habits. Now, if the habits were formed with support, like uh, my many of the habits, some of the habits I formed as a child, and many of them later, are very flexible. I learn something, and that this is the human genius. That becomes the basis for more learning. But the habits that were formed under emergency, I've had to simplify the world. I always handle that in this way. I have fewer categories for interpreting this particular event. Well, if you think about it, that's the neurotic personality, very much bound in habits. That is also the fascist thought pattern culturally. We reduce everything to us and them. 
white and black, uh, uh, conservative and communist, whatever, whatever it is. We've got a few categories. We re re reduce the whole complexity of the world to that. And why do we do that? Because conditions don't feel safe. So when people are under unsafe conditions, as children growing up, or as a society going through threats and changes, then they reach their simpli to simplify the field. I've got to be very mobilized here. I don't have the leisure to consider a lot of options. Emergencies might come at me. I have to simplify my field of experience. Um, but to, to maintain complexity, which is based, is required for creativity, I have to have more support. If I don't have it, I have to simplify my field. What's the basic simplifying move that humans make? It's us, them. It's to put a boundary in the field. This is us, my group, because we have to have a group, and that's them. And then I know where I stand. And we can have an enemy. And if, if you're on that side of the boundary, that's all I have to know about you. I don't need to know what kind of person you are and that you love your children and that you really wish we could have peace and you'd like to be. No, you can, don't trust all that. You're the enemy. I know everything I need to know about you once I know your category. Same thing on my side. All, all these people... Uh, <laughs> great, great. <clears throat> All I need to know is they're on my side. I don't, uh, I don't look into whether they're honest or dishonest or nice or not nice. So you see what I mean? We're having a, a trauma replication as we would look at it as a trauma case nowadays in, um, at, a, at a societal level at a world level, at the traumatic cultural world field. And it leaves no leisure, no safety, no space for the fertile void. So... So it's a kind of contradiction that uh, what we human species created on the earth. Do you hear me? Yes, but uh, not well. Speak a little louder. So it's a kind of contradiction that we human peace created on the earth, this complexity that you are speaking about. And it means there are so many, so many things parallel are, are in, with us in the here and yes. time. Yeah. We have to be very complex and very alarmed. And it, it mm -hmm. being alarmed cause fear because we are not insecure. So we we created a wonderful, complex world. At the very same time, we fix being in fear all the time. And yes, we, we cannot handle it without more support. Yeah. So we're in a state of alarm. That's a very good word for it. And what do we do? We reduce the complexity of the field. We have to. Complexity, creativity comes out of complexity. Complexity requires more support. So if, if you want um, uh, the alt, what we call the alt-right, the alternative right, if you want uh, fascism in the United States to settle down, we would need to have um, national health care. You know, for example, we would need to have more uh, safety and support so people could relax a little bit and not be so damn panicked all the time. So it's really a direct application, and it comes out of Gestalt theory, of clinical insights to a social level. Uh, and uh, hmm. Sorry. It no, you are speaking about connects very much to my next question. Mm -hmm. What do you think gestalt therapy represents nowadays in the world? Can you hear me? What do I think in the world today? Well, first of all, um, 
we can't help noticing, and it's quite relevant, that the brain model, the whole, the whole revolution we're living in of brain research, beginning to understand, we will look back on these as early crude days, but we're beginning to understand something about how the brain works and how the complexity of the brain works and how we educate and support people to have a robust integrated brain network so they become resistant to, uh, to panic, they become flexible, they become resilient to stress. We know how we can do that. Uh, we know how, what that brain looks like and how you train for it. Uh, that whole model is the Gestalt model. It is Kurt Lewin's early Gestalt model applied to the brain. The, the, the brain model of neuroscience today is that we have, we constantly approach new situations. We constantly resolve or assimilate them to old patterns or make new patterns. And, uh, and that that's what we do all day long. We're solving problems. That's how the brain works. It's doing uh, with more, and again, I keep saying with more or less support. So you get a different, uh, what you get with support and an integrated brain circuitry that activates, when the brain circuitry is integrated, you activate many centers at the same time. And every time I, you have a problem for me, I'm also looking at the expression on your face. I'm also aware of the emotions in my body. I also am having empathic centers working, which are supporting my... So there's all, all kinds of things going on, as well as memory and analytic problem solving. And that's all going on at once, because in a relaxed brain, you get multiple connections, and I respond creatively. But if I, if I have the opposite, it's like a short circuit to all that, and I only have one pathway I go to because of the alarm signal. So that's the same story over and over. That's the Gestalt brain model. Now being validated, you can pick up the uh, scientific journal or the popular newspaper, online, whatever, every day, and, and read more brain findings that validate the Gestalt a uh, brain model from that uh, <laughs> that is was totally radically different from the behaviorist or the psychodynamic model of the brain, the model of human behavior. So um, that's where you find Gestalt in the world today is in the entire world of neuroscience, which is taking over is the revolution in psych psychology. And it supports, well, it supports, for instance, confluent education, integral education, which is what Esalen Institute, if you're familiar with, with that at all, has stood for for 60 years. That you must educate all aspects of the person. They, these were insights coming out of uh, Eastern teaching before they were validated by brain by contemporary brain science today we know that is true when you uh when you train when you develop the body awareness and the social awareness and the spiritual capacity which is to go to that fertile void and the um, along with the intellectual uh when you have all these things developing together you get a resilient person a creative person who then can contribute much more to their own life and to society. Yeah. So it's exactly the education we need for today is Gestalt integral education. And that's being proved more and more. Yeah. Uh, so it's a very exciting time for neuroscience and for Gestalt, which have converged. So, uh, so that's one kind of answer. Yeah. So... At the same time, uh, I don't know exactly what the scene is like in, uh, in Central Europe now, but certainly in Western Europe and, and in the United States and, and, uh, and in much of Asia, uh, meditation and yoga and mindfulness and all these things are everywhere. 
Esalen used to be a lonely pioneer for these things 50 years ago, 40 years ago. It was woo-woo. It was far out there. It's what, you know, bored actors and actresses would go to Esalen and do some yoga. But other, it's not for everybody. Now it's on every corner. You go to New York City, on any corner, there's more than one yoga studio. You just look up at <laughs> Not just one on a, not just one on every corner. That's the, uh, the cliche. Yeah, <laughs> it's more than. Yeah, but, but uh, do you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, so the Esalen is is more than the place you are speaking, like a kind of meditation and yoga place. It's very holistic. First of all, Gestalt is there, and the scientific is there. And it's very rare that a flourish business and a holistic place and teaching, life long teaching is at the very same time, at the very same place, is together. And that's as Alan, right? Well, that's, a, of course, a great thing, but it's not as rare as it used to be, which is wonderful. We, want, we look at the world and we see Esalen being copied, not as a, not as a copycat copy, but being something in the inspiration of Esalen, a new center developing every week, more than once a week. Someone contacts us for advice about opening a new center. That's like mindfulness and meditation and everything else. These are methods of accessing the, the whole integral educational program. And, in, and a big part of that is the capacity to go, to step back and go into the fertile void which is, it's not everybody's language, but it is, to me, personally, a spiritual place. Spiritual in the sense that you're beyond materialism. You're beyond, this is my body and that's not my body. This is mine, this is yours, this is me, this is you. Uh, you have that sense of oneness that is so uh, refreshing. And uh, that's what I call spiritual. People have different names for it. People have different definitions of spiritual. It's not the end of religious. To me, it's a, that's also a religious experience, but not in a orga organized religion sense. It's a more, more than religion, no? Yeah. The religion, the religion of no religion, we say yeah, it as. Yeah. <laughs> So as I know, the place has itself a spirit because it's more than 100 years old, the place itself, right? So the property. Uh, Esalen started almost 60 years ago, but on a property that was acquired by the Murphy, by the founder's family, founder's grandparents, uh, over 100 years ago with the intention of opening a healing spa because these natural hot springs were there. Then came World War I, then came World War II, then the whole West California coast was blacked out for fear of invasion. They, the road wasn't completed. It was 1962 before they could get around to opening this institute. But it was in, but yeah, it reaches back to 1910. And, and of course, while I'm on that topic, uh, at Esalen, we have hot springs, natural hot springs baths, and we have uh, archaeological digs there that date the use of those baths back between six and 10,000 years. So it's a, it's a power spot that go, has deep, deep roots in the Native Americans. Yeah, and I see your face, how much it means to you. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hold on, can we go back? in time a little bit, which is not so, not so Gestalt uh, method, but can we go back in time? And my question is, what attracted you to what Gestalt at the very beginning? What method uh -huh. you or what? Exactly. When I was a young student at the beginning of my career, the very things I've said, because um, 60 years after uh, Wertheim and Kafka and Kurler and Exner and, and especially Kurt Lewin, uh, and, and Goldstein, after that generation of the 1900s, the teens, and the 20s. Uh, this, uh, I was in university and then in graduate school in the 60s. And in graduate school, in academia, our choices were behaviorism and psychodynamics. 
And both of them taught that uh, a, a great expert distance between doctor and patient. It was very much a patient model. It was still a medical model uh, of people's personal growth and personal development. And none of it seemed to address, it, it seemed that the whole world of psychology had nothing to do with um, the political revolution of the 60s, the sexual revolution of the 60s, the women's rights revolution of the 60s, the civil rights in, of, uh, of different minority groups, um, with economic justice, with, with finding meaning in your life. These are the things that motivated us in the 60s generation. Uh, experience and meaning and connection and sex and, uh, and, uh, and even what we would have called exploration of consciousness. The word spiritual would still not have been acceptable in psychological circles in those days. That was too bourgeois a word. <laughs> that came in later. <laughs> but, uh, but, the, but the topic was there, consciousness studies. Uh, we looked to the Freudians, and it was, they had nothing to offer us. They were beginning to have, Neo-Freudians were having a lot to offer us in early childhood development, in attachment theory. But that was very uh, marginal and renegade to the, to the psychiatric and psychoanalytic mainstream. Cross over to the other side, and you're in the world, on the behaviorist side, you're in the world of Watson and Skinner. And, uh, and how you train people, that people are very trainable, and that's all there is to it. And what these two different schools agreed on was that the experience you're having right now, first of all, the experience you and I are having have nothing to do with each other, because it's my experience is all in my mind, and yours is all in your mind. Now we know brain research, that is... <laughs> and that's not the case. We're affecting each other right now, physiologically, leaving a trace as we speak. So the mind is not all in the skull. The mind is here among us, being affected by it all the time. And, um, and uh, second of all, that my thoughts about what's happening, my experience, is irrelevant in both of those uh, in behaviorism, my experience was a byproduct. In, psych in classical psychoanalysis, my experience was a defense. And uh, it wasn't what was really going on in either school. So we needed, we needed something. I mean, I'm speaking about rigid caricatures, but we had rigid caricatures at that time. <laughs> and it, like behaviorism, didn't even call itself cognitive behaviorism yet. <laughs> they hadn't gotten that far. <laughs> and uh, and um, we needed something else. We were desperate for uh, those of us that wanted to work with people and wanted to work, you know, were drawn to people's problems and all that kind of thing. We didn't have any tool. We were going into uh, um, underprivileged areas into urban ghettos, into poor families, into multi-problem multi situations. And we're going to talk to them about Freudian concepts and, um, and behavioral schedules. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> it, so we, we were very hungry for something new, and Gestalt seemed to speak to it. Yeah, and that's what, yeah. that's what drew us. So do you remember the very specific moment you met Gestalt? Yes, I do. I mean, I guess I encountered it several times, but my, my uh, transformation, transformative moment came. I was training at uh, National Training Labs at NTL. Had been founded by Kurt Lewin, but, he, but the fact that he was a Gestaltist had been lost. <laughs> they didn't, he was a social psychologist. He had group dynamics, organizational consulting, organizational uh, psychology, uh, uh, action research, that all came out of Lewin. But it was not understood at the time that that all came out of a Gestalt theory base. 
all of that organizational psychology, group, group dynamics. And uh, so I was studying that because that had something, at least something to do with people. And, uh, and some people came there from the Gestalt Institute of Cleveland. Uh, Bill Warner and Carolyn Lukensmeyer. Carolyn Lukensmeyer is still very active today uh, in the Gestalt world and in the political world. And uh, Bill Warner is dead, but they were on the faculty of the Gestalt Institute of Cleveland and they came just for a couple of days to do a module in this training program at NTL in the summer camp of Maine. Um, and I took that and I looked at these two people and I thought, what is this gestalt that they're talking about? I've got to have more of that. I was like uh, 24, I mean, I was in graduate school. And, uh, and I knew I had to find out more about it. And we were reading Paul Goodman, my generation was. The political we had growing up absurd was on everybody's bookshop. I had no idea, and they were talking about Paul Goodman in this Gestalt workshop. It's not that uncommon a name in, in America, Goodman, Paul. And, uh, and I, had, I, I was shocked to find this was the same person. This political writer, this sociologist, who was motivating youth and stirring up the youth movement, was a leader for us, that he actually was in this very bourgeois practice of psychotherapy. <laughs> I was shocked. It's like, no, I thought those were two different people. <laughs> so that was my uh, epiphany moment. Like, there's something there. I've got to get more of it. Those two people and uh, have a different way of being in the world. They're present, they're sitting there right now in a different way from what I've been exposed to. And in particular, Bill Warner, remarkable guy. He didn't write, so it, only people who knew him personally uh, were influenced. But uh, I thought, this, this guy has a different way of being a man. Being a manly man without all that crap that nowadays we would call macho. We didn't have that popular term for it then. He didn't have any machismo. He just had a presence. And I thought, I got to have more time with him. <laughs> and I went to Cleveland and I got that and it changed my life. So when you realize this kind of bourgeois um, thing that being a psychotherapy is something very bourgeois and expensive and time-consuming thing. Uh, was it in, in your really conscious mind that you want to do more to make gestalt psychotherapy approachable for more people, so wider amount of people, and not to be bourgeois anymore for the next decade? <laughs> was it in your mind or it just happened in a way? Well, first I just wanted some tools were working with the populations I was working with. I was working with children and families, and as I said, underprivileged people. And also I was a political activist. So I wanted um, psychological tools that would have a political dimension. And I wanted tools that were relevant to people's lives, just the way we wanted things that were relevant to our lives that we weren't finding. So, um, I wasn't thinking yet about how to adapt Gestalt. It was, uh, it was more like they had the tools that I needed to get. And once I got the tools, uh, it began to get them. I mean, I'm still working on that <laughs> uh, because Gestalt tools are never ending. But once I began to feel I understood what it was about and could use it, then I found, I think, because I was often in public mental health clinics and all like that. I found that uh, where other gestaltists, some of them, my friends and my teachers, they were definitely talking about gestalt all the time in their sessions. I felt like, you know, um, you don't have to do that. 
I'm working with people that are not that educated. They don't care a bit about this word gestalt and when I'm talking about resistance or confluence and all like that. What matters is the contact. And I want to teach them the skills to have more contact with themselves, to have more agency, more autonomy in their lives, and also more relational support in their lives. Um, but I don't have to use those, I mean, I'll use a common word like support, but, um, or relationship, but I didn't use the word contact. Uh, I would talk about showing up, you know, things like that, like, uh, what, you know, what are you feeling in your body? But no jargon. So that was my own early approach to it, because I wanted to use it with the people I was working with, not as a, because otherwise it became a, another version of um, either workshop work, which was very powerful, but then a lot of long-term therapy with pretty affluent people, which I believe in. I love that work, but that wasn't what I wanted to be doing. You know, where you work in a certain way and they learn the jargon of that and their lives change and that's great and eventually they move on. And I looked at the people who were in training programs with me. Um, the Institute of Cleveland ran this big two-year training program, like 50 people a year. They were training, turning them on. Wonderful training, wonderful teachers. Uh, but most of the people who came out of it no longer called themselves gestaltists because they, they found that, that wasn't very helpful. The, that seemed too rigid for them. And I thought, yeah, but you are a gestaltist. You're using the gestalt. That's what matters. So I didn't worry so much about the, uh, the exact names, you know, the jargon, and, or also that, um, that you had to do the therapy in a certain way. Um, I felt like, no, I, my comp I have my compass from gestalt. The compass is contact. Mm -hmm. And the, the, when you have more capacity for contact, you have more capacity for dealing with your world. That means knowing how to show up, how to know what you're feeling, what you want, how to know what's out there, and how you and to take your own interpretations apart. Because after all, if, as Lewin said, we are naturally integrative, our, our minds integrate a picture. We... we apprehend things in whole pictures. Um, we get into trouble when the picture is too rigid, too, too uh, fixed. That's a fixed gestalt. Therapy, so our, our awareness is constructive. Therapy is deconstructive. We learn to slow down using the support of therapy or the support of the group, slow down, relax our emergency responses, undo our habitual uh, constructions, and check out what the different parts are missing, you know, take it all apart, and then it, can, it will put itself back together in a new and more creative way. Well, I found that's, that was what I understood as being gestalt. Not a matter of of this or that terminology or this or that protocol. Oh, wonderful. <clears throat> so can you can you mention one thing which would, you would say? Oh, that is about gestalt in my life. So that I became a gestaltist, and that's why there is something in my life. be. <laughs> is there anything? I'll tell you, there's a, there's, it used to be, before we had things online, there was a paper um, directory of gestaltists um, that was published every year. And you could buy this directory and you would know how, if you wanted to find a gestalt therapist in New York, you could look up the ones that were listed. And, and one of the questions, so when you listed yourself in this directory, they sent you a questionnaire. And you filled it out. And one of the questions was, what percentage of your work is gestalt? And you could write 10% or 80% or 50% or whatever. And I thought, <laughs> the question didn't make any sense to me. 
Gestalt was at an organizing level for me. So there was nothing, I'm getting around to your question. <laughs> I'm trying to answer it. Uh, there, was, there was no percentage. I felt like, no, Gestalt is my lens. That's how I look at the world. It's in my personal life and it's in my professional work. So it's all Gestalt. Uh, I'm, I'm in a, a, a lifelong quest for, um, for greater awareness, greater capacity, and better contact. No, uh, increasingly richer contact. Better contact to me means uh, I can have more complexity of experience. And then I can offer more complexity. I can offer creativity, the conditions for creativity to people I'm in relationships with. But that would include as a parent, now as a grandparent, um, as, a, um, as a citizen. Politically, I'm going to be doing that. As, a, as an administrator for many years at ESSA, as a teacher, as well as, uh, as a therapist. So it's in... That's my only answer is that it's in every part of my life. It's the lens of my vision. So the question has no sense for you, right? <laughs> that was the reality. <laughs> the question that didn't have sense for me was uh, the percentage question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if you, you could ask me the question, where is Gestalt not present in my life? And I would say, well, either the answer would be nowhere. <laughs> Or it would be perhaps in the fertile void. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in meditation, I feel I, in my best moments of meditation, I feel I'm in a place um, where we're, you know, the minute you put words on it, you've limited it. Um, but I'm in a place where there's. If I try to put words on it, I would say there's a hum going on in the basic ground of the universe. There's a vibration. What was the a, a hum, like, mm, you know, a, a, a certain frequency, a vibration. This is my experience, not a, not a, not a yeah, fundamentalist text. Um, and to me, that fundamental vibration of the universe, when we stop and let ourselves relax into the fertile void, when we're safe enough to do that, uh, that, that hum is love. That's the background vibration of the universe. So, uh, certainly I feel all tools have helped me get there and have that experience rather than be constantly distracted by past trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, but when I get there, I'm outside of Kishtal. I'm also outside of language. Yes. So, but sorry. I, <laughs> I, can't, I can't speak too clearly about it. <laughs> well, it's wonderful to hear. So, you know, Gestalt helped you to get there, to get the uh -huh. one place you love the most. It's yeah. The best mm -hmm. you can say. Well, yeah, and 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 uh, well, I have a lot of grandchildren, and the newest one is is four months old, and she's a little girl, four months old, and and I went up. My daughter had a, you know, she had to work, and the babysitter was on vacation or something, so I went up for two days last week and two days the day before to um, to San Francisco to to babysit this baby all day long and uh, you know she naps a lot but uh, and for sure he's in the fat I avoid right <laughs> yeah I just uh, I felt like first of all I could just sit and gaze at this wonderful face and she's gazing back at me and I'm in that for a void I'm not thinking anything so and it's and gestalt has made me capable of showing up like that, being that present. Um, certainly meditation and my meditation, uh, my, my principal teacher, 
has made a great difference, but that all came on top of and through the lens of the show. Mm. So, so I feel I owe to uh, the capacity to have that experience. Uh, is is a gift of Gestalt. I had that with my own children when they were small, but I couldn't really take two, I didn't feel I could take two days and just do that and not really do much of anything else. <laughs> and, uh, and just be in love um, because I had to build a career. I had to make a living. I had to manage relationships. I had to be in love in a different way. I had, you know, uh, I was so busy. I didn't have the uh, support that I have now to just take, if I want to take two days, I have to arrange it, but, but I can do it. <laughs> it's so wonderful to hear. It's really seen, seen on you that. <laughs> you are busy in emotionally, you are busy in the business, you are busy in uh, teaching and everything. So it's really a complex life, as you mentioned at the very beginning, complexity. That was, that was the word you mentioned the most. And that's very visible here as you are speaking. So we are rather close to the end of our session. Sure. And uh, I would like to express my appreciation that you have time and, and energy for, uh, for the, this conversation. And I enjoyed the whole conversation with you. And I have one more last question. Can I have? Please. And that is if there is any message you would say to the participants of the conference, because those people are come from very different parts of the world and a very huge diversity in ages. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you can say if it is a good message to most of them? Mm -hmm. You know, just the <laughs> common thing is that we will be all there in the very same place at the very same time. That's the mm -hmm. only common thing. And the get start, of course. I would say that, it's, I've been saying this for the past hour in different ways, yeah. that uh, humans are unique in two ways. And this very perspective comes out of Gestalt. First of all, we're the, we're the, we have this social capacity for social relational complexity. That's what we do. That's our superpower. That's what we're all um, superheroes of. Yeah. We can have these very complex relational systems. And that's how humans create. And that's how we have gotten to where we are in all the great ways and all the problematic ways. Along with that, we are, uh, our risk all the time at every stage in our development has been that we won't be able to handle that much complexity without reducing it to physical instinct. And, uh, and our frontal cortex does not do that. It doesn't reduce it. It has to be re reprogrammed with every new baby. That's why we're so creative. And that's why we're prone to overload. Our world today is in a crisis of overload. The technological revolution has meant that we are bombarded with complexity, and all the complexity of the world is hitting us all the time from everywhere. And the news of the typhoons in Burma, we know it has to do with industry in Ohio, pollution in, in uh, Moscow and America, you know, in, and uh, few coal, burning coal in China. And that's just affecting that typhoon. All of that is affecting us. Nothing, there's no single problems anymore. So what's our default to correct for that, cri that crisis of complexity? It's that we, while we carry this in our species, we default easily to an us-them. Our, our, our talent is complexity, social complexity. Our challenge and our risk is overload. And our species default, what we fall into when we don't have enough support, when we have too much stress, is oversimplification. Us, them. That simplifies the field. That's what we have to pay attention to. That's the... 
evolutionary crest that our consciousness capabilities that we stand on or hang on or will fall on today. We have to find the new organization of the world that is beyond the nation state. That's the old fallback, us, them. Nation state is built on us, them. We're the Americans, we're them. We're the Hungarians, you're them. We're the Israelis, you're them. But we're the Palestinians, you're them. And, uh, and that is uh, suicide for us now as a species. We have to get beyond that in our own consciousness, our own personal support, and politically, and the same, the same challenge politically in the world. Yeah. That means the, the theory topic for Gestalt today has to be support. We have to pay attention in a way that we haven't before to increasing support so that we remain creative flexible and open, able to nourish ourselves in the fertile void. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the summarization of your last hour speech, and uh, <laughs> it was really great and wonderful, and I hope see you soon, personally. <laughs> I really look forward to coming to Budapest. <laughs> yeah, coming to Budapest, and, uh, and to you, you and everyone coming to Esalen. I, I do. It's my plan. It's my packet list. So I will go. Great. Well, then. But I mean, everyone watching this as well. Yes. Come to Esalen. Yeah. I, I will. I do my best to get there. So we'll see. <laughs> and, I, and I can't wait to come to your city. Okay. It will, it will be really wonderful. Have you ever been in Budapest? Oh. Yes. One, one time in 1968. 68, wow. Mm. <laughs> different times, right? <laughs> oh, so different. I was there a, f a few weeks before the events in Prague, the 68th spring being touched off. Just before that. Cool. <laughs> it was the uh, Paris events had already happened and it began to sweep across Europe. So I do thank you again, and, and I'm very appreciated. And I, I wish you all, all the best for the rest of the time we meet. Yes, same to you. Thank you so much for these fascinating questions. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>